Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Fusion Industry Association. I'm Dr. Sid Cowley, and I work at the intersection of Fusion and AI at the FIA affiliate member, DigiLab Solutions. Today is Wednesday, the 5th of March, and I'm here to give you your Fusion News Roundup. Stories today include, one, German startup publishes open source plans for nuclear fusion power plant. Two, nuclear fusion, West Machine beats the world record for plasma duration. Three, the quest for better fusion reactors is putting a new generation of superconductors to the test. Four, doctoral training to develop the next generation of fusion energy experts. And of course, I'll have some bonuses at the end for you. One, German startup publishes open source plans for nuclear fusion power plant. Our first story today is a big one, and I'm really, really excited to get to share it with you today. The story is that FIA member Proxima Fusion just released its fusion power plant concept design. The concept, called Stellaris, is a quasi-isodynamic, or QI, stellarator, a type of twisted magnetic fusion device designed to minimize the plasma current going around the machine. Now, the design study was published in a peer-reviewed publication in Fusion Engineering and Design. It included analysis from multiple different perspectives, including plasma transport, which governs fusion performance, to neutronics, which tells you whether you can be self-sufficient in fuel and not damage surrounding material too severely. And this detail and rigor for a first design study is really astounding. According to Francesco Sirtino, chief executive and co-founder of Proxima Fusion, the study has full coherence on the physics and engineering side. This is a very long publication and a very technical piece of work. Now, there's a few things I love about this story. First, it's the first time we've seen a commercial Stellarator plant conceptual design in such detail and really shows the commercial and scientific credibility of the concept. Secondly, this is a huge success story for collaborations between industry and academia. The collaborators of this work include the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, of which the Proxima Fusion span out, Technico Lisboa, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and KIT in Germany. Now, one of the collaborators, Professor Per Hellander, head of the Stellarator Theory Division at the Max Planck Institute, IPP, said that this is important and necessary work on the path towards a fusion power plant, which we hope to accelerate through this collaboration. Finally, as part of this announcement, Proxima have also released some fantastic visuals on their Stellarator concept, Stellaris. I've always been captivated by the science fiction look of the Stellarator, and this is perhaps the best encapsulation of that sci-fi vision and dream that I've ever seen. I really recommend you check it out. Two, nuclear fusion West Machine beats the world record for plasma duration. Our next story has been featured in quite a few different outlets, including physics.org and covers a new record for long pulse tokamak operation of 1,337 seconds, and was achieved by West, a metal tokamak located at CEA in the south of France. Now, if you think you're having deja vu, you're not the only one, but you're not, trust me. A few weeks ago, the Chinese East tokamak broke the record for the longest plasma duration at 1,000 seconds. And apart from the very entertaining competition between East and West, it's a very exciting time. The tokamaks are rapidly and consistently breaking records in long pulses, which really paves the way towards long pulse steady state operation that will be crucial for future devices such as ITER. Now, Anne Isabel Etienne, Director of Fundamental Research at CEA, said West has achieved a now key technological milestone by maintaining hydrogen plasma for more than 20 minutes through the injection of two megawatts heating power. Experiments will continue with increased power. This is an excellent result that allows both West and the French community to lead the way for future use of ITER. Three, the quest for better fusion reactors is putting a new generation of superconductors to the test. Our third story today comes from Physics World and is a fantastic technical but digestible piece on the promise and challenges of superconductors in fusion. Now, as you may know, high temperature superconductors or HTS 
are superconductors which can operate at a much higher field, temperature, or current than conventional superconductors without losing their superconductivity. The ability to create these much stronger magnetic fields has really opened the way to many smaller, more compact magnetic fusion concepts, such as FIA member Tokamak Energy's HTS spherical tokamak. So we've heard all about the promise of HTS in fusion before, but what I really like about this article is that it dives into some of the biggest challenges behind the material science and development of superconducting coils for fusion. For one, the main group of materials used for most HTS are ceramics called REVCO, or rare earth barium copper oxides, and they are incredibly brittle. This means they can't really be made into the flexible tapes needed for fusion. To get around this, manufacturers use flexible metals and then deposit an incredibly thin layer of REVCO on top of them. Another big challenge is that fusion power plants will see quite a lot of neutron production in their machines, which can displace some of the atoms in the superconducting material, degrading the near-perfect crystal structure that they need to maintain their superconductivity. So, a lot of research today goes into understanding the impact of neutron damage on superconducting materials like irradiating samples of superconducting materials in real experiments and seeing how their properties change. However, many facilities today actually lack the real distribution of neutron energies that we'll see in fusion power plants. Finally, as we start to understand more about how superconducting wires are impacted by neutron damage, we can take measures to actually try and reduce the damage. For example, we can protect the magnets with material to shield the neutrons, or there's been research to show that bringing superconductors up to higher temperatures after irradiation has occurred may actually help the material to heal. Four, doctoral training to develop the next generation of fusion energy experts. For our final story, we have announcement from the UK on a new Center for Doctoral Training, or CDT, for fusion engineering. Now, for those who don't know, a CDT is essentially a consortium for graduates and PhDs built around particular topic areas. And the UK actually has a CDT on fusion power, and that's actually where I did my PhD. But as we enter this sort of commercialization development phase of fusion, we're needing a lot more skills, particularly a lot more in engineering disciplines, rather than the historic plasma science, material science disciplines. So it's with that idea that the UK Foster Programme launched a fusion engineering CDT, led by the universities of Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, and Birmingham. The CDT will train 150 postgraduates on a range of fusion-relevant engineering disciplines, with a big emphasis on input from industry, both the fusion industry and adjacent sectors. According to Professor Arun Bhattacharya from the University of Birmingham, Fusion engineering CDT students are the future of the fusion industry, stepping into a field where the challenges are unprecedented and the opportunities are limitless. Right, well, that's all for our main stories, but actually we have quite a few bonuses today for you as well. For our first bonus story, we have the fact that the Fusion Industry Association held our annual policy conference last week in Washington, DC. And I was actually very lucky to have attended the event myself. I must say I really enjoyed the event and I thought particularly it was lovely to see such a diverse mix of people attending, from fusion experts to leaders in the private industry to lawyers and utilities companies and even representatives from governments. For our second bonus, we have an announcement that FIA member Tokamak Energy has begun its first 2025 campaign on their spherical Tokamak ST40. Accompanying the announcement is a great video of boron being sprinkled into the Tokamak. I recommend you check it out. For our final bonus, our own FIA CEO, Andrew Holland, has been featured on PBS, where he discusses the global fusion landscape and how the industry is evolving, both technically, commercially, and politically. I really recommend you have a look at this one. Right, well, that's all for this week's episode of Fusion News. If you've been enjoying our content, please don't hesitate to subscribe and make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.